Hello and welcome back to World Health Plus Social Good. I'm Vismita Gupta Smith, and we're coming to you live from the 71st World Health Assembly here in Geneva, Switzerland. All week, we've been talking about the last 70 years in public health, because this is also the 70th anniversary year for WHO. So let's start this show today by looking back at some of the biggest achievements and some of the challenges that are coming up for us. Let's take a look at public health then and now. For seven decades, the World Health Organization has been working to improve everyone's health, whoever they are and wherever they live. We have worked hand in hand with governments and a multitude of partners. Together, we have made huge progress. Babies born 70 years ago lived an average of just 47 years, whereas today they will live an average of 72 years. That's 25 additional years of life. Seven decades ago, one child in every five died before their fifth birthday. Today, that figure has dropped to one in every 250. People would live in fear of infectious diseases with no known cure. Polio epidemics swept through communities, paralyzing millions of children. In the past, smallpox infected 50 million people every year. Now, smallpox has been eradicated from the face of the earth, and cases of polio have reduced by more than 99.9%. But there is so much more we can do, and we cannot afford to lose momentum. More than half of the world's population is still missing out on essential health services. Non-communicable diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease now account for 70% of all deaths. And by 2030, climate change could cause an additional quarter of a million deaths annually. In our interconnected world, infectious disease outbreaks can spread more rapidly than ever before. But together, we have shown we can tackle the most complex global health challenges. Every month, the World Health Organization screens 5,000 disease outbreak alerts and sends investigative teams into the field to track hundreds of potential threats. More than 180 countries have signed up to the World Health Organization Anti-Tobacco Treaty, covering at least 90% of the world's population. And we are monitoring air pollution in more than 4,000 cities in 103 countries. The World Health Organization is committed to leading the global drive to promote health, keep the world safe, and protect the vulnerable. That was a look at public health then and now. As you can see, some big challenges for us and our work is cut out for us. At this assembly, our 194 member states approved our general program of work. It's the document that outlines our goals, our mission for the next five years. Uh, on Tuesday's show, we spoke about universal health coverage and how we plan to expand universal health coverage to a billion people in the next five years. Yesterday, we discussed WHO's work in serving the vulnerable and how we plan to improve uh, health and well-being of an additional 1 billion people. And in today's show, we will focus on emergencies. This is one of the most important roles of WHO, protecting and saving lives in emergencies and preparing countries to save lives in emergencies. In the last 12 months, WHO has responded to 50 emergencies in 47 countries. In today's show, we will speak, we will talk to our experts about Ebola in DRC. We will then look at our response in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. We will then also talk about challenges to vaccination in emergencies. And we will take a look back at our uh, work in immunization and influenza. So send us your questions. You can tweet us your questions at WHO. Use the hashtag WHS71 and hashtag social good. Susanna Rosenblatt from UN Foundation is standing by to ask our que your questions from our experts. Hi, Susanna. Hi, Vismita. It's really exciting. We want to thank all the viewers that are tuning in. Yesterday, there were audience members from more than 50 countries around the world. Today, we have viewers in Malaysia, India, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, the Philippines, Nepal, India, Sri Lanka, 
Norway, St. Lucia, Australia, and Myanmar. So thank you to everyone tuned in. It's exciting to have this kind of global reach. And we have a few messages coming in um, from Abdul Nasser, says he's uh, um, an MPH from Pakistan and a polio eradication program monitor. So that's fantastic that you're committed to fighting this terrible disease. Um, we also have folks who are saluting WHO for your unwavering support to health improvement worldwide. That's a comment from Marylise Deterra, so thanks for tuning in. And Sriyani Padmalatha from Sri Lanka is a registered nurse, PhD candidate who's watching. We also have folks watching from Bihar, so thanks to everyone. Thank you very much, Susanna. Susanna will keep tracking your questions and asking them from our experts. In this segment, we will talk about Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So please send us your questions on Ebola. I want to start by, with a clip of our Director General briefing member states about his visit to the Democratic Republic of Congo. After the Ebola outbreak was declared by the government on May 8, uh, three of us, uh, decided to go to um, Bikoro, the epicenter of the outbreak. And when we met our staff, they were worried about us, then about their own life. That commitment actually even triggered uh, another commitment from, from us, and we said, we will come back to you. You know, you have, every individual has one life, you're risking your life coming to you and being with you means nothing because your life is as important as anyone's life. But that level of commitment is something that we should really build on. That's what's going to make a difference. That was the Director General, Dr. Tedros, talking about his visit to Bikoro. And uh, the three people uh, that you saw in the clip as well, and he referred to our uh, WHO's Regional Director, uh, Dr. Machi Diso Moeti. We're really hoping that she'll be able to join us uh, in this segment. During the World Health Assembly, the usual business of assembly carries on, but then a lot of other work also happens through bilaterals, and our uh, officials are often caught up in meetings, but we're really hoping she she'll join us. Uh, the third person on that trip with uh, the, the regional director was the deputy director general for emergencies, Dr. Pete Salama. Thank you so much, Dr. Salama, for, for joining us. I want to start with the situation on the ground. When you went with uh, the director general and the regional director, what did you see? Please catch us up on the situation. Well, the, the first thing that uh, really we had to grapple with was how to get there. Uh, because this is an extremely remote, rural part of Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's really hundreds of kilometers of the most densely forested land that you can imagine. From the air, and we went by small UN aircraft, first of all to the provincial capital, Bandaka. All you can see is dense forest land, very little infrastructure, very few paved roads, a few dirt tracks and mostly forest. Then from Bandaka, the principal cap uh, capital with about uh, a million people, we then uh, took a helicopter, again another UN flight, to the epicenter, Bikoro, of the outbreak. And Bikoro uh, really has very little infrastructure. We went with uh, Dr. Moeti, who's just joined us. Uh, welcome, Dr. Moeti. We went to Bikoro, and uh, there we went to the hospital. Extremely poor infrastructure, literally walls falling down. Very little power in that uh, in that uh, town unless it's generator supplied, very little running water. And that's of course now the base camp for uh, the epicenter of the outbreak and our response. So you can just imagine the challenges associated with mounting a response where now we have more than 120 WHO staff from all levels involved and where we're trying to contact trace across hundreds of kilometers and we're trying to deploy a vaccine that has to be kept between negative 60 and negative 80 degrees Celsius in areas of the world without power. I want to talk about all of those issues in a, in a minute. Welcome, Dr. Moeti. We were Thanks. just talking. Dr. Salama was giving me, uh, giving us and our audience a, a brief on what uh, you found on your visit when you went to Bikoro. Now, uh, there are a lot of partners working on the ground, um, and we have, as Dr. Salama said, we've deployed our uh, staff as well. Tell us what it looks like, the coordination on the ground. Um, I think as Peter said, uh, this is a very challenging area in which to have deployed such a large number of people. However, 
Uh, I'm aware that, uh, and we did meet the local leadership of the health ministry, and we have had, uh, more or less from the start of this outbreak, our staff who have been working side by side from, with them, initially deployed from the country office and then supplemented by people who've come from the other two levels. And between them, WHO and the ministry staff are working to coordinate all of the partners who are arriving there to support uh, uh, several areas of the work, including uh, surveillance, responding to the outbreak, treatment, uh, contact tracing, etc. Community engagement, particularly. Right. Doc, Dr. Moeti, this is not the first outbreak in, in DRC. Uh, what, what, tell us about the country's preparedness. The Director General spoke uh, yesterday as well about the transparency, about how well coordinated uh, the ministry is in conveying information to WHO. Please speak to us about that. Yes, I think what is good about this is that the, the DRC has previous experience in managing and controlling outbreaks of Ebola. Uh, and some of the experts that have been deployed in other outbreaks by WHO are nationals of this country. I think that is a plus. However, uh, in the past, most of the outbreaks have been in isolated rural areas. For example, Last year, around about this time, in Likati, uh, we had an outbreak which was controlled within a relatively short space of time. That was in an isolated rural area. This, this combines several aspects which make it much more challenging. It is indeed, uh, in one aspect, in a very isolated rural area. But in addition to that, it is not very far from an urban center of a million people, and it's along a long river which actually connects the epicenter to one of the most populated cities on the continent of Africa with 10 million people, as well as uh, the Congo and the Republic of the Congo and Central African Republic. So it is a challenge to the country as well as to WHO and partners, which is why we've taken this so seriously. What was a big plus was the speed with which the government uh, declared this outbreak and also established their own coordination mechanism and worked so closely with WHO to have an incident management system working. That's a plus. Dr. Thank Moeti, um, it, it was recently decided that this did not warrant a public health emergency of international concern. What needs to happen in an, in an outbreak for it to be declared? Uh, well, <clears throat> I think it has to be an outbreak which poses an immediate threat of rapid international spread in terms of uh, the level of risk, in terms of the capacity to manage, in terms of population movement from the epicenter of such an epidemic. I think these are some of the elements that, that come into play. So as you know, there is a mechanism, there's an independent emergency committee on international health regulations which advises WHO and the Director General on the level of risk and whether this is to be considered a <coughs> public health uh, emergency event of international concern. They analyze the number of uh, related factors, the, uh, the distance from, uh, if you like, support structures where this outbreak is, is taking place, which is both a challenge, but also may help to contain such a, an outbreak locally. They looked at the response capacity in the DRC, including the experience that I referred to before, and concluded that there was a high level of national risk, there was some regional risk, but this did not yet constitute a public health event of international concern. We, we're going to talk a little more about that. Uh, Dr. Salama, um, you have spoken about an epidemiological knife's edge. Could you explain that to our Facebook uh, viewers, please? Sure. What I meant by that is that the next few weeks are going to be extremely telling in determining whether this outbreak is going to expand and get worse or be brought under control relatively quickly. And really the factors that we're concerned about are some of the ones that Dr. Moetti covered. The fact that now we have Ebola in an urban area. The fact that that urban area is next to the Congo River with connections internally to big cities and externally to, to the Republic of Congo and to Central African Republic. A country itself, of course, that is facing an internal conflict and has very poor infrastructure. Uh, we also have the fact that we've had health workers infected, around five, and that's a tragedy in its own right, but it's also a risk for further amplification. Thirdly, 
we know that the logistics in this area is extremely difficult. We're talking about hundreds of kilometers of densely forested area, and we're going to have to track contacts across all of those areas in order to ensure that they're cared for if they get sick, but also to vaccinate them if they don't. So it's a, it's a huge effort. And then finally, here we're dealing with more than one epicenter for the outbreak. Often in these situations, especially early on, we can concentrate our resources around one area. But here we have four separate parts of the northwestern uh, province that we have to really focus on at the same time. So Dr. Moethi, uh, talk to us about the contact tracing that's going on. If you could explain that to our audience. How is that done? I, I mean, I think it's simply done by being aware, first of all, of course, from the cases either suspected cases, confirmed cases, and meticulously tracing their movements and the contacts that they've had at home, at work, in public spaces, in, in, uh, in markets, in, in public places where people might go. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we have in place now, and it is one of the challenges to mobilize the capacity to ensure that we track every single person that this, this case might have come into contact with and are able to follow up and find those people and know where they are and then in turn see who they've been in contact with. It's quite a meticulous procedure that needs to be done in a great deal of detail in order to be able to map absolutely every contact that this person has had which might constitute a risk. I want to take some audience questions at this time, Susanna. Thanks, we have a couple coming in. The first is from a viewer, Lavanya Monica, who wants to learn more about how Ebola spreads in the first place. Is, uh, is that a question for Pete? I think it's for either panelist. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Whoever would. Um, so e Ebola has a natural reservoir, so it lives in normal times uh, in animals, and particularly fruit bats, and certain species of fruit bats are the natural reservoir. But then it also uh, jumps to other animals. So it can be found in species of apes, in species of monkeys, in species of porcupines, and other animals. And of course, many of those animals are in the forests uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so people have contact with them through either hunting uh, or through other means, such as in marketplaces. And that's generally how we see that leap from the animal kingdom through to the, the human side. Another question from the audience? Sure, I think again for either panelist, Azamat Bayalinov from Kyrgyzstan is asking, how can we improve partnership between the Red Cross and Red Crescent societies and WHO on the country level in emergencies like this? Dr. Moethi? Um, <clears throat> yes, I, uh, I, I think we are actually improving this partnership. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a visit from uh, in Brazzaville at our regional office by the regional director of uh, the International Federation of the Red Cross, uh, Fatumata, Dr. Fatumata, who came to talk to us about how to work together on outbreak uh, preparedness and response in countries, and particularly how we can leverage the huge number of uh, volunteers, which, which constitutes a really big potential workforce to support various actions in countries on um, on outbreaks and, and emergencies. So I think we are already in a very good place to improve that partnership. We are asking our country reps now to reach out to the local uh, societies to work with them and to bring them into the space that the ministry is creating for such work to be done in advance of an outbreak taking place to really create a partnership with them on an ongoing basis both for building preparedness and of course very importantly for mobilizing their volunteers when something does happen in a country. To add to Dr. Murthy, this morning I met with El Hajj Assi, who is the uh, President and Secretary General of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. And we discussed the situation in the DRC, and we talked about the importance of community engagement. And as Dr. Murthy says, it's such an opportunity because the volunteers that that the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement can bring to bear can really be determining factors in terms of really helping to engage and communicate with communities. So it's really a win-win partnership for WHO to be involved with the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement. So I want to end with the challenges on the ground. Let's start with vaccination. Could you please speak to that? 
Yeah, so as you know, we're attempting something very different. In fact, it's the first time we've really used uh, this investigational Ebola vaccine in the context of a major Ebola outbreak. We've used it before in the context of really very specific uh, vaccination trials for research purposes at the end of outbreaks. But here we are in the beginning of a major outbreak using this product. And what we know, and it's really important for everyone to understand this, we call it investigational. But we do know this is a safe and effective vaccine. It's just going through its licensing process. So that's important for everyone to understand. It's also important to understand that here is very different from our regular mass immunization programs. This is a very targeted vaccination program. So what we do, and it's very similar to the contact tracing that Dr. Moetti described, we identify a case, confirmed or probable, then we identify all of the contacts of that case, so household contacts, uh, hospital contacts or healthcare workers, neighbors, church-going friends, and then we identify the contacts of those contacts and we form protective rings around that case. And really the aim is to protect the contacts from becoming infected, number one, but also to prevent the outbreak from spreading uh, throughout the community. Dr. Moeti, I'll give you the last word on it, on the challenges on the ground. Uh, yes, uh, as, as we've already touched upon, uh, uh, I think logistics and having the sufficient numbers of people deployed in the right place in uh, ways under conditions that facilitate their work, that keep them safe as well in these very remote areas which are at the, at the epicenter of this uh, outbreak. So as uh, you may know, we traveled to Bikoro with the Director General and with Dr. Salama and we could see uh, very, uh, firsthand how difficult it is to get out there. So we had to take a plane and then had to have a helicopter simply because road travel between Bandaka and Bikoro is so difficult. So for me, this is one of the most difficult challenges. And of course, add to that the fact that you'll need to transport equipment, material, to continue supplies for the large numbers of people and for the operation itself. This, to me, is going to be the most challenging aspect. I have to say that uh, we've been very encouraged by the huge <clears throat> indication of support by various partners, not only the financing. So, so dealing with the logistics under such circumstances will be costly, I think we have to acknowledge. But we've been encouraged that uh, some major partners have come forward and shown themselves willing to support that because with, without being able to operate, it will be a big challenge to, to address this. I do also think that... Um, Having learned from the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, we must, in addition to flying people and things in, be in touch with the local population in the most effective ways and engage them through people that they trust, interlocutors that they are accustomed to hearing messages from, to ensure that they in their turn play their part appropriately. Dr. Moethi, Dr. Salama, I know you are both very, very busy at this time, not just with this response, but also with your roles at the Assembly. So thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. There's another emergency unfolding, which is at the moment uh, in, in Bangladesh um, with the Rohingya set, uh, settlements there. Now, this is a long-term protracted emergency. Nearly 671,000 Rohingyas have crossed over to Bangladesh from Myanmar's Rakhine state. And they're living in mega camps in Kutupalong and Balukhali uh, camps. And there are also 11 other camps around there. These Rohingya people, along with the host population, need health services. WHO has been working and responding to this emergency for almost a year now. And the person leading this at the regional level is Dr. Poonam Khetrapal Singh. Welcome, Dr. Khetrapal Singh. I wanted to start with you, uh, st start by um, asking you about the situation on the ground. You went to Cox's Bazaar. What did you see and what is the situation on the ground? Thank you very much. Yes, I did visit Cox Bazaar in March this year. And what I saw there really showed to me what devastation large population movements can cause because since October, since August rather, 25th last year, populations started moving from the Rakhine state of Myanmar to Cox Bazar in Bangladesh. And this included women, children, old people who came in there and tried to settle there. 
So what they did was really build uh, temporary shelters, houses for themselves. This is a place which had a lot of trees, so those trees were felled and used to make huts. They had roofs of topoline. Um, they had toilets, which um, a number of them there. And because this land is sloping and trees had already been cut there, there was a lot of loose mud, which I saw. In fact, when I walked around, I found the mud under my foot slipping. So that worries me when I think of the monsoons that would be coming now. The water sanitation situation wasn't the best, chiefly sanitation. Water at least could be uh, made safe through chlorine tablets, but sanitation is a big issue because of the undulating terrain. There are some toilets at the top and there are those which have come up at a lower level. There is water pumps at the lower level because the only way water could be provided was through hand pumps and when the monsoons come the situation would get even worse the water would get contaminated especially the water at the lower level so that's something that uh, is worrisome when we look there i saw health facilities there some have been set up by ngos like BRAC, and there there was the samaritan purse there too which was uh, which had a diphtheria treatment center. There were a number of government facilities. In fact, one facility had just recently come up, which was a fixed facility. Uh, and there I could see that um, there was a arrangement for pregnant women, for deliveries. There were um, toilets there. So that facility had provision that was expected of a health center. The rest of them were all uh, temporary kind of facilities which had come up. There were a number of them. There were mobile vans that were there. I saw food being distributed. The government was distributing food through the, and WWF was helping in that. The World Food Program was helping in that. Uh, people were carrying sacks of wheat home. Uh, there is the host community there also. There are about 30,000 host community there. Apart from the Rohingyas which now moved, which total about 67,000. But some had moved in earlier. So if we look at the total population there, it's uh, 1.3 million, which is a lot for that area. And the Prime Minister, when I met with her, explained to me that when they help with food supplies, they also have to take care of the host population. They cannot distinguish between those who have now come in, displaced from their homes in Rakhine, and those who already were existing there. And she also explained that they had lost the agricultural land because all these huts had come up there. And therefore, um, her attempt was to see that at least the population there got food to eat. Dr. Ketabal Singh, you've just described the, the situation on the ground and you mentioned the monsoons coming up. Could you speak to what is needed on the ground? Now, with the monsoons coming and what would really be needed most is to stock up supplies, which we have done. We, I visited the warehouse where we have over 150 metric tons of supplies which we have been sending, which WHO has sent. These include uh, equipment as well as uh, drug supplies. There have been a lot of experts who have been sent there, not only from the region, from, from headquarters, from all over the world who have gone there. We've been coordinating all the partners there to see that how best we could respond to a worsening situation when the monsoons hit really hard. Uh, we also have uh, the Guan uh, outfit which has helped us. Um, so WHO is really trying to see that how best can we respond to this if the situation gets worse. Now water and sanitation is an area that we also are very worried about. And that is something that we've been working closely with UNICEF to see 
how the sanitation part could be handled in that situation. There are, of course, a lot of pregnant women, and our estimate is that uh, in a year, like the deliveries that would occur, say, in the next 12 months would be about 60,000, which is a lot. We forget that even in emergencies, babies will still yes, be born. We still have to make sure that absolutely. mothers have safe delivery and children yeah. survive. And most of these deliveries are home deliveries because there aren't enough facilities for them. But the deliveries will happen. And therefore, that is one part which also needs to be addressed, for which we are trying our best and working very closely with the government of Bangladesh to see how best we could help and respond to this crisis. Uh, Dr. Ketrapal Singh, I want to stop for a minute uh, to take a question from our audience. Susanna? Sure. Um, Nazmoon uh, Nahar from Bangladesh. Could you speak up? Sorry. Sure. Nazmoon Nahar from Bangladesh is wondering um, what WHO is doing to plan for any disease outbreaks that might be affecting this population. Disease outbreaks is what worries WHO the most in an emergency situation. And uh, there was a diphtheria outbreak, but it could be contained because WHO uh, with other partners and the government came up with three rounds of diphtheria vaccination. Mm -hmm. We've also given cholera vaccination, two rounds of cholera vaccination, two rounds of measles and rubella vaccination. We've given vitamin A dose. So we were trying our best to see that we prevent outbreaks. It seemed, of course, looking at the population that the immunization rate was very low from where they had come and therefore immunization was the way to go and to see that the population there now is totally immunized. In fact, we've just finished with our second round of cholera vaccination. We just finished about two weeks ago. That and that, number of people yes, to it was a massive campaign. And we gave it to everyone over one year old. So it was a large population to handle and a massive campaign that we had. Dr. Khetra Pal Singh, this is not the first emergency that you and your team have handled. Southeast Asia region has, it, it is prone to many natural disasters from earthquakes to floods to cyclones. This is a different kind of an emergency. But one thing that doesn't change for WHO is our coordination role. Uh, please speak to us about the coordination effort that has gone on. You're right, absolutely, that the Southeast Asia region is a disaster prone region. and. We had the tsunami, which we still haven't forgotten, the tsunami of 2004, which was the worst disaster we had and which affected six countries of our region. And we've been prone to earthquakes. We have Indonesia, which has more than two or three earthquakes every week, more than five on the Richter scale. We have floods, we have landslides, you name it, and we have it. But this, as you rightly point out, is a different kind of an emergency and a disaster. So we did coordinate about 100 partners on the ground. I still remember the first time when we had the tsunami and I tried to coordinate the partners because I went to Aceh then. I found it difficult to get the partners around because at that time we were not, everyone was not clear of their role. Let's say the cluster approach had not come up in the UN. This time, now over the years, 2004, 2018 is a long way. And now we find that it's easy for us to play that coordinating role in the health sector. So we had about 170 health facilities, which we are trying to coordinate. And we had about 100 partners. We provided an operating platform to our Goan friends who came there. So WHO did its best to coordinate a good response to this crisis. Dr. Ketrapal Singh, thank you very much for taking the time from your busy schedule and joining us today. Thank you. You just heard uh, the regional director of the Southeast Asia region for WHO, Dr. Poonam Ketrapal Singh, talk about the monsoons and her worries about health uh, in, uh, of the Rohingya population in Bangladesh. You also heard her talk about vaccination. 
Now, uh, diphtheria is just one of the diseases uh, which is a high risk in a situation like this. Measles is another one. And one of the most challenging vaccinations that we're facing on the ground is actually the polio outbreak in Syria. And here to talk to me about this and, uh, is Dr. Michelle Zafran. Welcome, Dr. Zafran. It, uh, speak to us about the polio vaccination in, in Syria. What, why is it so difficult? We've go, been through many rounds. What are the challenges in vaccinating in a conflict zone? Well, obviously, well, thank you very much for your question. Thankfully, we have not had a case of polio in Syria since September of last year. We're not sure that the outbreak is closed yet, but certainly um, the work that has been done by uh, the WHO staff helping with the partners as well as, the, of course, the national uh, staff in the country have been able to carry out some, some complicated um, campaigns in an environment where, you know, the country was torn and the the epicenter of the outbreak was precisely the center where uh, ISIS was located. So it was complicated to carry out the vaccination. But because people are so committed on the ground, um, the Syrians themselves, and uh, they are committed to the safety of their children, we were able first to deliver the vaccine with the agreement of all fighting parties, keeping a very neutral uh, attitude of the program and saying what we want is protect the children in the country. So we were able to, while negotiating ac access to all of the uh, um, relevant areas to actually ensure that that vaccination rounds were being conducted. I'm, I'm grateful to my colleagues who have worked on the ground there um, in, under very difficult circumstances and of course to the frontline workers who have carried out this work for the efforts that they've made. So far, we, uh, we have not seen a case, as I indicated, since uh, September of last year, and we're hopeful that we're going to be soon able to close this outbreak. Now, um, on Tuesday, Michelle, we had an expert here talking to us about smallpox, uh, the only disease that we have eradicated so far. Uh, polio, we are hoping, is going to be the next disease that we eradicate. Uh, but there are many challenges on the ground at the last mile. As we look back at the 70 years, uh, on, you know, in our 70th year anniversary, in our 70th anniversary year, I want to talk about uh, two issues. One is polio. Michelle is here to talk to us about polio, and the other is influenza. Joining us now is Dr. Sylvie Brian, who works with, uh, who's the director for WHO's work in influenza. Welcome to both of you. Before we talk about polio and where we are. Tell us about uh, what is known as the expanded program for immunization. What was the world like as we look back before the expanded program and after? Well, the expanded program on immunization was launched by the World Health Assembly in 1974. And basically it was meant to be um, succeeding the uh, smallpox eradication program. When member states realized we were able to eradicate a disease like smallpox uh, by a concerted effort and using a vaccine, they decided to expand on the smallpox experience and six childhood diseases, so diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, measles, tuberculosis with the BCG, and polio. And so that was the expanded program on immunization, which um, started in a very slow pace, but quite rapidly. When we started, we were about at 5% coverage uh, globally for these uh, childhood diseases. Quite rapidly, UNICEF came on board to support the World Health Organization and UNICEF with its procurement mechanism with um, uh, not only for the vaccine but also for cold chain equipment, joined forces with WHO which was setting the norms and the standards and training uh, health workers and helping countries establish their own individual program. And through that mechanism, quite rapidly, the, 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 the world got uh, very close to 80% coverage. There was a universal child immunization target of 80% coverage worldwide, which was more or less achieved in 1990. So, you know, quite rapidly over a number of years, the expanded program in immunization uh, enabled countries to um, strengthen their access to all of their children and then deliver the six childhood diseases, which is now, of course, expanded to almost 12 antigens. And as the countries around the world were preparing and vaccinating children and protecting them, polio became, uh, became one of the diseases that we decided we want to aggressively uh, eradicate. Tell us about our progress since 1988 in polio. 
So uh, quite rapidly, um, the Americas decided that polio could be eradicated. Uh, and in fact, uh, thanks to Rotary International launch an effort to, uh, to eradicate polio. Uh, polio was declared eradicated in four of the six WHO regions. So we've eradicated from the Americas, we eradicated from the Western Pacific, from the European region, and in, in 2000, um, uh, 11, we eradicated from Southeast Asia. So we have four regions of the world that have been sort of polio free for many years now. We're still struggling with eradication in the Middle East, in AMRO, and in the, in, in the African region. We have only three countries now that are considered as endemic with poliovirus, with the wild poliovirus. Um, Nigeria, which hasn't had a case for over 600 days, so we're getting close to being feeling more comfortable. However, because in the northeastern part of Nigeria, there's still uh, a small part of the country of one um, uh, local government area uh, in Borno State, which is not accessible to, uh, to vaccination, we cannot sort of be sure that the virus is no longer circulating. And then Pakistan and Afghanistan, which have had a total of nine cases this year so far, eight in Afghanistan and one in Pakistan. They've made tremendous progress towards uh, eradicating the circulation of the virus. But of course, we're fighting with the most difficult places in these countries where access is complicated, where the population is moving very, very um, often, and it's def therefore uh, very difficult to make sure that every single child is vaccinated. Dr. Zafran, I had the privilege of uh, working uh, and training uh, uh, training polio workers in Pakistan last year, uh, uh, and uh, you know, in communicating the risk uh, to their populations, and it was palpable how uh, everybody is so invested, and they they are just. Uh, holding their breath almost to make sure there isn't another case and when a case appears it it uh, brings down the morale and then we build it up again. Why is the last mile so difficult? The last mile is difficult because we need to actually make sure that every single child is protected against the virus. The virus sort of uh, uh, declares, it can infect many people but will declare the disease only in one in 100, in 300 cases. So you won't see the disease all the time. So it can circulate silently and therefore, if we don't vaccinate every single child, uh, the virus can hide in some of these very complicated places where we are not sort of uh, uh, present and are, are not able to detect the virus. So it's very important that we have very strong surveillance system and that we actually have access to all of these areas. So we are fighting the virus in places that are the most complex of the world, you know, in the in the border areas between Pakistan and Afghanistan, in some of the areas in Afghanistan where basically there is war, uh, in, in northeast uh, Nigeria where also there is a conflict between uh, the government and, and uh, anti-government elements. So access is really the problem. It's also difficult to reach every single child because child first are born very um, soon, very often, and also populations, particularly in Pakistan and Afghanistan, move a lot. There are migrant population across the border or within the countries that are difficult to uh, track and, and vaccinate very well. Uh, but if we implement the strategies that we've defined, we know that we can do it. We've eradicated in, uh, polio from India. India, nobody thought that India would be able to eradicate polio because of the similar situation to some of the places we're fighting with the virus now. Nonetheless, India hasn't had a case for over seven years. So we know the strategies work. We just need to implement them to continue our efforts. We are so close. We've never been that close. And I'm convinced that the two or three remaining countries that are fighting the virus will deliver polio eradication. Here's to eradicating polio and doing that soon. Another disease that WHO works tirelessly on is influenza. This is also the 100 year anniversary of the Spanish flu, which claimed 50 million people and sickened 100 million people. Although WHO was not created at that time, 100 years ago, that outbreak shows how deadly influenza can be. WHO spent significant amount of time trying to prevent influenza outbreaks and prepare countries for them if the outbreak happens. Joining me now, Dr. Sylvie Brienne. Sylvie, tell us, uh, we hear about seasonal flu, and yet sometimes you get the sense that people don't take it as seriously at, as they should. Why is WHO so concerned about seasonal flu? Yeah, I think that um, m most of the people have experienced a common cold. 
And so they think that flu is like common cold. But in reality, uh, flu is very frequent, but many people don't know that have got flu because they don't necessarily go to the doctors to check if it's flu or not. And so I think in the statistics about flu, we miss really a significant number of cases and especially in mild diseases. But it's still a very important um, a disease in terms of public health because many people are dying every year from flu. And our latest statistics show that uh, between 250,000 to 600,000 people are dying every year from this disease. So talk to us about WHO's work in preventing influenza. Yeah, so we work very closely with uh, our member states to uh, really develop uh, strategies against influenza. Fortunately, influenza uh, is, uh, I would say, a whole disease. So uh, now we have uh, a number of interventions that are available. That we have a vaccine, we have also antivirals, and a number of things that we can do to prevent the disease to spread. And so various strategies have been used in the past, and we try now to uh, just uh, scale up those strategies to make sure uh, people are protected. The difficulty we see is mostly in tropical countries, because in temperate countries, flu occurs through seasonal waves. So it's uh, easy to detect it and to see when you have an outbreak. But um, the transmission in tropical country is throughout the year. So people tend to um, uh, forget that it exists first and also forget that it's probably the first cause of childhood mortality because 50% of pneumonia are due to viruses and, and probably uh, flu is the main killer also in tropical countries. Um, audience on f Facebook and Twitter, what is it that they need to keep in mind about flu, about influenza, and what do they need to do to take preventive measures? So influenza mostly affects certain high-risk groups. Uh, pregnant women, for instance, young kids or elderly people or people with underlying conditions such as um, um, difficulties, asthma or, or uh, other um, respiratory diseases. So for those people, it's very important that they uh, have uh, vaccination in time uh, so that uh, they don't uh, do severe disease. But if they are not vaccinated, they can also have an antiviral treatment in some uh, countries. And also this helps to reduce uh, severe diseases. Otherwise, I think what is also uh, really important important is basic uh, uh, precaution, respiratory precaution, um, such as uh, washing hands um, uh, and also um, cough etiquette, uh, so that, uh, because the virus is transmitted when you have close contact and also um, uh, with your hands or when you kiss people. So when, when you have a cold or you are sneezing or coughing, it's, it's better to try to reduce those contacts so that you don't transmit the disease to your uh, beloved one and, and your family members. I want to end this segment with, a, with an audience question, Susanna. Great, thank you. Um, we've got viewers uh, who are healthcare workers that are tuned in, including Melvin Miranda, a nurse with Manila Central University in the Philippines, as well as Evelyn Castro, a nurse watching from Costa Rica. And we have a question from Ashford Leroy Tom um, on polio. Uh, has the polio vaccination process in Syria been successful thus far? and are Syrian refugee camps outside the country affected as well? So the, the, the vaccination activities in Syria have been extremely successful because as I indicated, um, although we are not sure that the outbreak has been interrupted, um, we haven't had a case uh, caused by uh, the virus uh, since 21st of September of last year. Um, uh, in, in many of the refugee camps, there are preemptive measures, indeed, uh, which are coordinated by the countries themselves where the refugee camps are, are held, uh, as well as by the international organizations and the global polio eradication initiatives, all of the partners that work um, to eradicate polio, uh, to ensure that the refugees in the camps receive the vaccination. Thank you. Another uh, question from the audience? Uh, it was a similar question, so perhaps the same answer holds. A question from Conquer Mabuba Jamil about step steps being taken by WHO to prevent poliovirus infection among the Rohingya community in Cox's Bazaar. Um, among the community in Cox's Bazaar, if it's similar steps being taken. 
Oh, the Rohingya, yes. yes. Thank you. I mean, uh, basically, there have been campaigns uh, of vaccinations against many of the childhood diseases in this uh, refugee, um, in the, this population that have been uh, moving. And not only against polio, uh, polio was one of the vaccine administered, but against measles also, as you've indicated, which is a very infectious disease, as well as diphtheria. Uh, so basically, the, the the, the, the package of childhood disease uh, vaccine which we have available in the expanded program on immunization are usually administered in this crisis situation um, and it's been the case uh, there. Well, uh, we're going to end with that. So thank you very much Dr. Michelle Zafran, Dr. Sylvie Brian for joining us on our last show. That's a wrap for us. But the assembly continues till Saturday. So keep watching our social media channels for more news. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.